My name is Sean Murphy. I'll be moderating this session. My firm is SK Murphy, and I'm really pleased that we have Ed Ipser on today for this mini workshop. Ed is president of Ipser Lab, a startup foundry. He's also managing partner at Coactify, a creative pivot and turnaround consultancy. Ed brings considerable expertise as a serial entrepreneur to these roles. He has founded, co-founded, joined, or advised many startups. As a founder of Market Fusion, he raised $23 million in venture capital. He founded SFACE, the Silicon Valley Association of Software Entrepreneurs, back in 1996, which became the premier Silicon Valley entrepreneurial organization before merging into the SD Forum. He received a PhD in computer science from USC. Ed? Thank you. Um, so I'm going to uh, share screen and start with the slides. I've also posted a link to a Google Drive that you should have access to and you should be able to make a copy and that's important in order to participate in this presentation, this workshop. And so I'll, I'll get into more what you wanna do with that as we go through the talk, but please take some time, uh, make a copy of that in your private space. And obviously it's gonna be a lot of confidential stuff. So Sean has covered most of these points already. So um, you'll see some little bit of my background here. I'm gonna add a little bit more details. Um, um, my, my Zorn experience was very, uh, very interesting in part because uh, the, the co-founders that I was working with refused to pivot from our original vision. That was, I didn't even know the word pivot then, but I knew we needed to change something and, and they refused to change. That, that was definitely um, something that, that uh, really struck me as, as crazy. Um, with Market Fusion, I went through several pivots before funding and then a few more after that. Um, Ipser Lab, we're doing pivots all the time, mostly small pivots, but startup number one did one extreme pivot from travel book to luxury travel planning. Two did extreme pivots, uh, two extreme pivots around IoT and agriculture. Um, that was the only thing that was common between the, the, the different versions. And four, st startup four just made a big pivot from uh, a debating platform to a video tool for complex conversations such as debates. So there's just thin thread uh, connecting the two, but otherwise very much uh, a big change. But but every day making small adjustments to, to all of those. Quactify on the other hand is helping companies to execute uh, what I call creative pivots and turnarounds. I'll explain a little bit more on what I mean by that later on. Um, and currently we're helping a client to pivot from selling technology into oil and gas, which has been really harmed in the last uh, year or so from the coronavirus uh, into a more diversified portfolio of comp companies, uh, customers. So that's that's what I'm doing. So um, my thoughts on startups are in this book. I wrote this book for my Ipsa Lab startup CEOs. Um, if you're only gonna read one book, I think this is it. I wrote it with that in mind. So I love reading books, but if you don't like reading books or if you want something really short and sweet, um, this, is, this is a pretty good treatment of the subject. You know, I, one thing I like to do is distinguish a pivot from a turnaround. So, so a pivot is a change of direction for a startup that's not yet achieved product market fit. And, and that's the, the, the way I distinguish between pivots and turnarounds. So, and pivoting, especially with the startup, you know, you're, you're doing, it's a continuous process of building on what you, um, you already know or what you're learning and making small changes, trying to penetrate the defense and, and reach the, the, the touchdown. So um, it can be as small changes, you know, it, some of you've actually mentioned already, small changes to maybe how you're, you're selling your product, distributors versus direct through the web or, or some, something very you know, small changes even to the product that you're offering. Or obviously they can be much bigger changes, but but the smaller changes as we've discussed earlier are, are the preferred, preferred option because they maintain your momentum. The, the, the more radically you change, the more you lose momentum and 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 risk a lot of, of, of problems down the, down the road. So um, part of what you're doing in a startup is you're, you're looking for glimmers of partial success and then you're orienting on those opportunities, kind of like a, a running back seeing a space between the defenders. You're looking for those opportunities and jumping through them. Um, so pivot may require shedding customers, team members, even co-founders uh, at the extreme, but um, again, it can be something much smaller than that. A, a turnaround by contrast is a change of direction for a business that has had a, a product market fit. So. Um, if you've had some success and suddenly something is not working anymore, now you've got a slightly different problem. There's a lot of commonalities between pivots and turnarounds, but there's some important differences as well. So um, 
one of the big differences is you've got a lot more momentum going behind you, employees, customer relationships, you know, product, a lot of things that are in place, um, investors. So, so often the traditional turnarounds involve a lot of layoffs. You know, you're trying to cut back your costs, you lay off people hoping that you can trim back to the muscle and, and, and get something, get something lean out of the process. Sometimes it even requires firing the CEO. So a lot of times you'll hear a turnaround start with the board of directors fires the CEO or he quote resigns um, and they start with somebody, maybe an interim CEO uh, who's gonna lead the company through whatever darkness, a valley of darkness and, and find the light. Um, what we're doing at Coactify on the other hand is we're trying to work with the CEO to focus the turnaround efforts and work with the CEO and through him to, to find success. So, so that's definitely not what we do. Um, and, and, but basically sometimes, you know, it's reorienting on new markets, um, in extreme cases, it might be a matter of breaking down the business into its component parts and reassembling it in a different way. So the turnarounds can obviously be very radical as well. My, my objective today is to, to help you debug your business. Um, some of you definitely are in that boat right now. So those, those people, I hope that, that this will be helpful to you. Some of you are just thinking about this or um, or just interested in the subject, um, but maybe you can look at this. This is a workshop and I'll come back in a second, but look at that in terms of something you're engaged in currently or thinking about doing. Um, I think you'll get a lot more about out of this experience if you do that. What I'm going to do is, is help you to, to learn some basic tools for doing pivots and turnarounds and to uncover overlooked opportunities. And, and again, this is a workshop, not a seminar. Um, I, I, in, the, in the chat, you will see a link to a folder that you should be able to have access to. If anybody doesn't have access, if you came in too late and don't see the link or whatever, um, please uh, let Sean know and, and we can share the link again. Um, but what you should do is make a copy of that folder in your private Google space, and that's going to be uh, what we're going to be working on in terms of work, you know, the workspace and things. So you, you should be working on this. This is a, sem a workshop, not a seminar, but you don't have to share. So, um, you know, obviously things that are going wrong in your business can be a, a you know, a sensitive matter. Okay, so, so the first step we're going to go through is what is one of my favorite creativity tools called Face the Fear. Um, and, you know, I have been this boat, you know, several times and, and particularly thinking back to, to Zorian, um, but also to a certain extent market fusion, you know, one of the challenges you have is, you know, facing up to the fact that you need to do a pivot or a turnaround. And, and a lot of times people are very much in denial about that things. Um, everybody wants to put on a happy face. Um, you know, don't want to discourage other people or, you know, don't want to even discourage the wife and, and uh, you know, or even themselves sometimes, you know, it, it's, it's a really a frustrating thing to, to, to deal with. You have to recognize you need to change. So, so the first step is to recognize that you need to change. So, so if you go into the, to the workbook you have, you'll see there's an exercise there. I'm going to have you guys do that in just a minute. Um, but, but, you know, the, the phrase that I, I like to use is that, that, you know, your biggest possibilities lie on the other side of your fears, right? So if you can get past your fears, think, you know, about the things you need to do, the things you need to change, there may be some huge opportunities on the other side of that. So the face the fear tool, what we're going to do, um, is in two steps. And the first step we're going to do next is just make a list of the things that make you uneasy or fearful. Later on, and this gets into the, you know, the quote scientific part of this, we're going to be coming up with a list of supporting and dispelling facts and some experiments to uncover those facts. But for now, all I want you to do is, you know, get into the workbook and you can do it on pencil and paper as well. You could even do it in your head, but, but I think, you know, putting it down on paper somewhere or down in, in, a, in a Google document is, is much more effective. Um, list out the things that are making you nervous, uneasy things that you were embarrassed to tell are the people, your employees, investors, and so on. Um, maybe even things that, that are causing you to sleep at night. So let's just take five minutes to do that. We're gonna look at two types of canvas now. So, so the lean canvas is for startups and hopefully you've seen this before. Uh, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this today, but I will go through just kind of the basics here just to make sure everybody is, is familiar because we're gonna use this in a minute. Um, and the other is the business model canvas, which is actually the origin. Um, and so the, the business model canvas came first, it was designed to, to represent in a, in a very, uh, um, very crisp way, um, traditional businesses that, that are much larger. 
Um, Ash Murray adapted it as the Lean Startup Canvas. Um, just a few of them are similar areas, but a lot of them are different. So if you're a startup or a small business, I think, um, you know, then I think this is going to be more appropriate. If you're a larger company or further along, then the business model canvas might be more appropriate. But when in doubt, I think use the Lean Startup Canvas. So Lean Startup Canvas is problem solution. Um, if you haven't done this before, definitely you should sit down and, and do this now. Again, there's the template in the folder that I shared with you, and you'll find an editable version there. You can just quickly go into that. We're going to do that in just a minute. Um, but just identify the problems you're solving, what you're doing to solve that problem, some key metrics, unique value proposition, um, what it is that you're doing uniquely. And there's some hints in the document that kind of give you some ideas uh, of what you want to put in there. Um, unfair advantages, um, what it is you're doing that's that's different from your competitors and how you're going to beat them and so on, have the channels you're using. Um, customer segments, or what I, I prefer to call it customer profiles. Um, what exactly is your main customer and how, how do you describe them and how you distinguish them? And maybe you've got multiple segments, but if you're a startup, probably you shouldn't. But And then lastly, cost and, and revenue streams. Uh, if you have one already, uh, just refer to that one, bring that one out, and maybe take a fresh look at it. Um, but um, in any case, lay out your, your own business canvas. So, so go ahead and we'll do that. Hey, Ed, I'm unfamiliar with that term, um, unfair advantage. What, yes. What is that? So an unfair advantage, um, a simple example would be a patent, right? Let's say you've got a patent for some technology, your competitors don't have that patent. That's the whole point of the patent is to be exclusive. That's a simple example. It might also be some know-how that you have, right? Or maybe you've got some connections with a distributor um, and you can lock out your competitor. Um, and so unfair, you know, it could be, you know, it's a matter of degree, obviously, um, but, but it might be just, you've got some first mover advantage. You've been in doing this research for 10 years and, and you can now create some products or solution that, you know, way ahead of the competition. Mm -hmm. So well, kind of think, like that. isn't that a value proposition though? No value proposition, the unfair advantage, think of that as the internal things, right? These are things that your customers don't care about. These are things that give you advantages over your competitor. The unique mm -hmm. value proposition is something you're doing that the, the customer gets value out of. And Sean, feel yeah, free. Yeah, absolutely. I just thought that would be a subset of that. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay. Okay, that's ten minutes. Um, I'm going to stop and continue here, um, but but please continue working on that. You know, as as and when you can. But as you see, we're going to make use of this in the next section, uh, or actually in a few sections down. So the next topic. This is much more what you'll see in a conventional. Um, turnaround uh, is situation where you're looking if somebody comes in top typically with a financial background with an eye shade view, you know, a green eye shade view. Um, what you want to do is an assessment of your, your assets and your liabilities, right? Do an inventory of this. So, so a lot of this is taken from Sean's book, Working Capital, which I highly recommend. Um, but, but what you want to do in this next exercise, we're going to be making a list of these things in your business. So, Financial and physical capital, this would be straightforward things like a bank account, you know, equipment that you've got, you know, computers or factory equipment or whatever, inventory. These are kind of your, your traditional um, financial and, and working capital things. Then you've got intellectual capital. This is where you're going to have to really do some soul searching. Uh, patents and copyrights are pretty straightforward. We mentioned that earlier in, um, you know, unfair advantage, but generally in intellectual know-how and trade secrets. So this is where... Um, you really need to think about what it is that you know that other people don't know. What are the things that you you have in terms of intellectual um, you know, know-how? So, so think about that. Um, but then uh, the other area which almost nobody thinks about is, is social capital, right? So business relationships, contacts, and even your reputation, right? So these are things that are very valuable to you as a, as, as a individual and to the business that you're running. Right, so so the business relationships, your partnerships, your customers, your your noteworthy customers or important partners or distributors or whatever, contacts, the list of people you have known all over your life, and hopefully you've got them in your LinkedIn and maybe your Facebook as well. Um, these can be quite valuable. 
And, and then of course your reputation, maybe you're, you're a blogger like Sean, or you give uh, presentations or you're well-respected in your industry, whatever, um, or your company is. So, so these are the things we're gonna be talking about in terms of assets. On, on the liability side, you know, again, they're kind of traditional things like debt, short and long-term, you've got taxes due, leases, accounts payable, um, legal actions, if somebody's suing you for a product or, you know, employee or whatever, um, definitely need to, to take those into account. Um, again, the softer area that you, you, you want to take an inventory of, and that is your, your obligations, your, your commitment. So customer commitments, for example, you might have a contract with a customer or you maybe have, have an arrangement with a beta customer to deliver something. Um, or you've just made some promises to, to some customers. So customer commitments, employees and contractors. So, so even if you can firing people, fire people, it's, it's painful to do. It's much more fun to hire people than to fire people, right? So you definitely need to take into account um, the employees and contractors you have. Those are obligations, if, if, if nothing else, um, not necessarily legal, but, but definitely there can be some complications there, but, but certainly there, there are things that you will hesitate to, to make changes. Um, co-founder promises, you know, you and maybe a co-founder or two join to start to a startup you did to do X. This was my experience with Zorian. I, I, I got, I got brought in two co-founders and it's, Hey, let's turn my PhD thesis into a commercial product. And they said, yeah, okay, let's go do that. And we got into that, found that it wasn't working. Um, I thought we need to make changes. My partner said, no, uh, this is, we, we plan to do this. Let's stick with it. And, and so, uh, we did, and it didn't really go very well. Um, but co-founder promises can definitely hamper your, your ability to make changes. And pr investor promises, you, when you talk to, when you pitch investors, when they invest in you, it's the same kind of thing as I mentioned with co-founders. You've made certain commitments, you've made certain promises about what you're gonna do. Um, a good investor is gonna recognize the value of the team, the decisions of the team on the ground. Um, but there are a lot of uh, stupid investors out there who will make you stick with what you promised or just, you know, question your, your competence and maybe um, pull you out as CEO if they think you're not going to be able to execute on what you promised them. So, so definitely going to keep those in mind. So, so we're going to spend, um, again, let, let's try five minutes on this, um, but there's a lot of stuff here. You know, I'll, I'll do a check as, as we go through this and see if you guys really need the full 10 minutes, uh, just like we did before. Uh, but again, in the, the folder that was shared with you, you'll find um, the, the documents you can use as a template. Uh, the one, this one's called business inventory. So list out your assets and try to do a kind of rough job of ranking them by value. And likewise, your liabilities, you know, start out with the obvious things and work your way down uh, to the things that are a little bit harder to, to, to grasp, but, but, but uh, go ahead and get to work on that. Um, oops. Um, so now we're going to do the second step of face the fear. So, so go back to the face the fear document. Um, but, but, but just kind of mention a little bit about this, you know, a lot of people avoid their fears, but, but the truth is fear is a motivator, you know, and, and it's something that, you know, your gut will tell you something's wrong and you rationalize it away. And this is, this is the problem that, that a lot of startups face, a lot of businesses face, um, and, after the fact, they'll say, yeah, we knew something was wrong. We just didn't speak up or I didn't want to rock the boat or, or, you know, I hoped it would solve itself or whatever. Um, but, you know, you need to think of fears instead as just an indicator that something needs to be investigated, right? And it may be that just facing up to the fear is enough. It may be that, yes, it really is an irrational fear and you just need to spend some, some time with a psychiatrist or something like that. But... But the odds are, if you've been in business, if you've, you know, if you've got experience, your gut is probably telling you something is going wrong and it really is going wrong and you need to investigate it further. And when you investigate it, then you can act on it and then you can address it. And then, you know, it becomes an indicator and not something just that's just torturing you at night. So, so what we're going to do is going to look at each of those fears you had. And again, you're doing this privately um, in your own document. But um, what we're gonna do is look at that. And for each of those fears, look, think about and look for supporting facts and facts that contradict it, right? And, and you really need to do both of those, right? So, so if, if it's a fear, you know, and there may be some things, try to, try to search back, what is it that gave you that fear? When did you start feeling this fear? When does this fear crop up? Maybe it's every time you talk to, you know, a certain customer or every time you walk into um, your engineering department or something like that. Ed, Ed, could you give an example? 
Oh, right. So, so, um, you know, one of the most straightforward fears that, that we have is that the product we're selling isn't, nobody wants to buy it. Right. So that's a very classic fear that, that, in, that, uh, um, startup uh, founders have. So, so at the early time, you have an idea for a product, you get very excited, you build a product, and then, you know, you start worrying, okay, is anybody going to want to buy it? And maybe you go out and make a few clumsy sales calls and they don't go well. Um, and so now you've started to develop the fear that, yeah, you, you built the wrong product or something like that. Right. So, so this is a very classic fear. Um, other things would be, you know, that your costs are too high, right? You start worrying about, are you ever going to bring your costs into, into line with your revenues, right? So, so you might be getting nervous every time you get a bill in the mail, right? Or every time um, you write your, 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 you send out your, um, um, your, 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 your uh, salaries, um, payments for, for employees, right? Or you're, you're paying, making your monthly payments to your, your subcontractors or whatever. Um, so, so there are a lot of things that you face as a businessman. And if, if you're in business, you're definitely going to be encountering these all the time. Some of them are little niggling things. Um, like, is this software that the engineers promised really going to work? Right? That might be a fear. Maybe you think they're, they're blowing smoke up your ass. Um, these are, you know, think about just, yeah, lots of examples like that. Sean, Sean maybe you could think of some other examples. So I candidly have never met anyone who was afraid that no one would buy it. <laughs> of, all, of, all, of all the problems that I've never met that I've, I've, I have met a lot of entrepreneurs looking for smarter prospects. Okay. Well, all right. There, the you there you go. There you go. I can't meet the people that are smart enough to yeah. appreciate what we've built. Yeah. We uh, did have one. We had one question from Dave. I thought that was quite good as well which was you have to figure out the customer segments ahead of time or can you discover them along the way? This was back and yeah. filling well, this, out the link canvas. Yeah, th that's an excellent question. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the timer on this one. You guys should start working on, on your, your, for each fear, the supporting contradicting, and then I'll address that question because I think it's a really good question. So All right. that is a, a specific question that is again, coming back to the more general one about pivoting, right? So. So I am a strong believer in, in the pivot and figuring things out along the way. And Sean and I had, had a little bit of debate about this, but I define pivots very, very um, grandly. I, I think a pivot is anytime you make a change to your, your business model canvas or your, your lean canvas. And that could be really small changes. It could be changes to features and products, stuff like that. I absolutely do think that you should be thinking about exploring this uh, along the way, but you absolutely do. That's the beauty of this canvas. Um, and, and, you know, you can't just say, okay, I want to be in business. I'm going to go start doing something and, and just kind of blindly search along. Having the canvas, having these things laid out really helps you to think about them. And the other thing that, that having the canvas does, it, it's a brainstorming tool that allows you to about, think about alternatives. And that's a lot of what we're going to be, you know, what we're doing today, right? So it may be your brainstorming channels, for example, and you come up with 10 different channel possibilities, but you're only gonna explore one at a time, right? Or maybe two at a time if you're really ambitious, but you're certainly not gonna try to take all 10 of them on, right? So, so you're, you're focusing on a particular, let's say version of the canvas where you're, you've got a problem, a solution, a channel, et cetera. But behind that, you've got all these alternatives you brainstorm. And as you go and you work in the market, as you experience, you know, selling, building, you know, solving people's problems, um, you're going to get other ideas, right? So you add them to your, your kind of at the brain, the canvas as a brainstorming thing. And then when you realize you've got problems, when you get this, these fears in the pit of your stomach, when that's when you kind of go back and want to say, okay, do we need to make a change here? Right. And so the combination of having these things written down somewhere in your canvas as alternatives and possibilities and the confidence that you can come up with alternatives so you don't feel like okay this isn't working i need to you know go out and and and, and give up and get a job at google or whatever um and you know that that i think those two things will give you a lot of ammunition for for making the, the pivots that are necessary going forward and that doesn't i don't mean to trivialize the challenge of doing a pivot but you know one of the biggest challenges is that people don't feel like they can do it right that they feel like okay this was my brilliant idea it's not working i don't know what to do next um so so yeah i, I know that's kind of a long answer all right so we i've got some this is in the slide in the in the folder you can kind of go through this these are really the, the parts where i where we build on what we did before so kind of use your imagination look at your situation from different points of view 
Okay, so, so here's some examples, part one and part two. So this is what I want you to go back. This is the homework. Um, go and prioritize your fears, validate your fears, you know, look at your supporting and contradicting facts. And, you know, if you're more uh, mathematically or scientifically inclined, you know, think about it in terms of experimentation, um, develop the new facts by, by doing your experiments and, and then adjusting your priorities along the way. For each of these validated fears, try to identify two or more canvas changes that you could make to address that, right? And so that's your homework, go off and do that. You've got the tools now to go and do that. So, so that is the end of the presentation.